Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Martin with the Marcus Heart Valve Center at Piedmont, Atlanta, and I'm thrilled that you're joining us, but mostly I'm thrilled that I'm with my guest, uh, Dr. Phil Pierbo, who is a well-known expert in the field of aortic stenosis. Philippe is at the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute. Thanks so much for joining me. Appreciate it. We've learned a lot from you over the years. So let's, let's talk a little bit about a confusing subject, low flow, low gradient AS. Tell us, you know, what's our current state of knowledge about this? Yeah. So when we have these patients with high gradient AS, I mean, um, th these patients are not really challenging. Right. If, they are, if they have symptoms, uh, they have a class one indication for valve replacement, they need to undergo surgery. Where it's getting more difficult, it, when you have these patients with low gradient, so there is one parameter, the valve area, telling you that the stenosis is severe, right. but the gradient telling you that the stenosis is not severe. And, and you have to take a decision because this patient has symptoms. If this is severe stenosis, right. you need to go to surgery. If not, the patients will be followed medically. Uh, so uh, we knew for a long time that patients with low EF, uh, may have a low gradient uh, despite severe stenosis because when the flow is reduced, the pressure gradient across the Come valve down. is going down. Sure. And we do the vitamin stress echo to resuscitate this gradient and demonstrate the severe stenosis. Um, uh, but a, a, a relatively new entity that has been described for the first time in 2007 uh, is more complex because it occurs in patients with preserved LV ejection fraction. So they've got a normal LV. Normal LV, flow, normal low, LVF, but low flow. Low, low because for a long time we assume uh, that having a normal LV ejection fraction means that you're going to have a normal flow across the valve. And so that you, to, 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 if you have a severe stenosis, you need to have a high gradient. But actually, we learned from the HPF population that you may have a low gradient, a reduced stroke volume, despite the preserved LV ejection fraction, because the patient has diastolic dysfunction, atrial fibrillation, concomitant mitral regurgitation, and the concentric remodeling with small ventricles. I mean, this, this small, These thick small, ventricles. Small, thick ventricles. They may have an LV ejection fraction of six, 60 or 70%, but still, the stroke volume, what goes Very out small. from the ventricle, is low. And, um, and so, these patients have always existed, but before we were trying to reconcile the discrepancy between valve area and gradient by maybe measuring a diameter, a VOT diameter a bit larger and trying to, um, but finally we realized that many of these patients actually have a low flow and they do have a severe stenosis despite a, a low gradient. Now this, these are challenging patients still because- How do we diagnose that? Uh, well, the first, uh, first, first cause of this discrepancy between valve area and gradient is measurement error. You know, the most frequent, uh, uh, right. because many of my fellows, they come to me, oh, I have a paradoxical low flow, low gradient here. And actually, when you reassess the, 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 the measurements, you realize that the, the, the LVOT diameter was underestimated. Right. Because, right. you know, it's the most challenging. Yeah, uh, it's really the yeah. actual heel of, of, the, of the measurement of the valve area. So we need to, to, uh, to do it right. We need okay. to measure. Um, uh, at the right place. Uh, I think this is where also 3D imaging modalities may be useful. 3D echo or CT may help us to Correct. better assess the LVOT diameter. So this is one thing. Um, once we, we are reassured, we rule out the measurement error and we have this situation with a small valve area, low gradient and, 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 and the low flow. Um, well, still, I mean, uh, you need to confirm the stenosis severity. Because these patients, they may have a pseudo severe stenosis, just as a low EF, low flow, low gradient. The valve may not be completely open because the flow is not sufficient right. to completely right. open. So, in the low EF patients, we use dobutamine stress echo. In these patients with you know small thick ventricles, small cavity, dobutamine stress echo is not the ideal test. Um, in these patients, what we we do more and more is uh, to assess the aortic valve calcium score by multi size right, CT. Right. You know, this is flow independent. You don't need any stressor. Uh, this is re reproducible. You can, you know, uh, apply it in, in every lab. And, and if the calcium score is high uh, and you need to use different cut point in men and women, then you can corroborate the stenosis severity and, and be confident to refer the patient to surgery if, if of course, the patient has symptoms. I mean, it, it, seemed, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I'm, I agree with you in the sense that I, I think the extent of calcification you've got in the valve really does tell you about the degree of stenosis you've got, regardless of everything else. Yeah, exactly. I think the only subset of patients where you may have 
know of very little calcium, although you have a severe, a severe stenosis, are the, uh, the younger patients with bicuspid valve, often right. the younger women. But in these patients, you don't see the low, the low flow, low radiant situations. You know, it's more in the elderly population with calcified valve. So, 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 the, so if you've got low flow, low gradient AS with a bad LV or decreased EF, dobutamine's the- Low dose the, dobutamine stress, echo. If you've got low flow, low gradient with a good LV, then, then a calcium score. Yeah, rule out measurement error and then calcium score to corroborate the stenosis severity. And then that tells you whether you go to, to operative intervention in those patients. Right, and in terms of intervention, some recent studies from the partner trial in particular suggest that these patients may do better with transcatheter valve replacement right. rather than, because these are patients with small ventricle, small annulus, so uh, they are more prone to uh, perioperative complication and also to prosthesis patient mismatch. Right, so if you mean. replace a gradient of 30 millimeters of mercury by 25, you know, uh, because you have mismatch, um, I mean, you don't really uh, help the patient. So this is a subset of patients where maybe TAVR, transcatheter valve replacement, may be superior to, to CYBER. I mean, I was going to ask you one other question, but I want to just sneak something in here. You mentioned the, uh, the magic words, patient prosthetic mismatch, a very confusing subject. So how do, how do we diagnose that? So this could be uh, not surgical valve or even a TAVR valve. Yeah, absolutely. How I do we think, diagnose that? Well, mismatch is a, is a very, uh, it's a very simple concept. When I talk to uh, engineers, they say, well, this is silly. I mean, of course, you know, uh, if you have a, uh, the, 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 the prosthetic valve, is not as good, right, as perfect right. as the normal native valve. So you have some uh, prosthesis patient mismatch is a residual aortic stenosis. You know, you, sure. the, the effective orifice area of the valve is not large enough for the, uh, the cardiac output requirements of the patient. And so you have some residual gradient and this may have an impact on the outcome of the patient. But then you're right. I mean, the diagnosis is, is difficult because you need to measure the effective orifice area, which is challenging in prostate valves, even more in transcatheter valve, Very because so. where to measure the, the LVOT diameter again. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, so there are some, some pitfalls with the measurements of effective orifice area. And then you divide the effective orifice area for the body surface area uh, to, to, to take into, into consideration the, the balance between the, the, the hemodynamic performance of the valve and the, the cardiac output requirement of the patient. But then, you know, we, we, uh, a large proportion of the patient, especially in North America, uh, are overweight or obese. Correct, correct. So when you use the body surface area, you may uh, overestimate uh, the, 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 the degree and, and of prosthesis patient mismatch. So I think there, what has been suggested in some recent uh, guidelines is to use lower uh, cut point uh, in obese people. So, for example, uh, that would be 0.85 centimeters square per meter square to define mismatch in right. normal weight patients, and it's going to be uh, less than, than uh, 0.70 for obese people, so BMI uh, more than 30. The other thing is uh, what to consider is that uh, the mismatch that is really uh, bad for the patient is the severe mismatch, so right. when the index AOA is below 0.65. Moderate mismatch will be well tolerated in most patients, except maybe those with depressed LV function. Right. For example, the low EF, low flow, low grade in patient. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in terms of preventive strategy, I think we should avoid mismatch or do some alternative procedures um, only in those patients where we, we anticipate the risk of severe mismatch or moderate mismatch in patients with poor uh, LV function. Great, last question. We've, we've learned that um, calcific aortic valve disease is an inflammatory degenerative condition, okay? And, and, it, and it has mimicked or looks like an atherosclerotic plaque to some extent. So that led to the th feelings, well, you could treat people with statins. Um, that hasn't quite panned out. What, where, where do we stand with this, with lipids and inflammation and potential treatments and those sort of things? Yeah, so it, for now, the only treatment that we have for severe aortic stenosis is to replace the valve, sure. surgery or transcatheter. Um, but now, is, the, is there any hope and, and something in the pipeline in terms of medical therapy mm -hmm. that would mm -hmm. slow or even block or even regress the, uh, the progression of aortic stenosis? Well, you're right. I think there has been, uh, there is a strong body of evidence that a lipid-mediated inflammation plays an important role in the, in the mineralization and stiffening of the valve. And so, of course, the, the first class of drugs that the people think of was a statin. And, and, and then three randomized, later, uh, three randomized trials later, 
it failed. I think this is because um, uh, statin may help on one side because they, they reduce the LDL and also have some pleiotropic effects right, and right. anti-inflammatory. But on the other end, they have some, they have, uh, some pro-calcifying properties that have been shown in coronary artery disease in particular. In coronary artery disease, this is not uh, very detrimental this because it stabilizes yeah, the plaque. It stabilizes the plaque. And, and this is more the, the um, uh, so the, the uh, but in, in, in aortic stenosis, of course, the culprit lesion is a calcium. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, may, uh, you may worsen the calcification and also worsen the insulin resistance, which may, uh, may uh, promote the, uh, the progression of the calcification of the valve. There's, there's been some uh, very interesting uh, data published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, in particular uh, uh, last year, and uh, showing that the, actually the uh, lipo lipoprotein A, the LPA, uh, is a, seems to be a causal factor um, for, for calcific aortic stenosis. And we recently published a paper, uh, because the, the first paper was uh, more G-wise, and it right. was to, uh, to compare patients who had calcific uh, aortic, valve, aortic valve sclerosis or stenosis versus those who had right. no. But the patient that we see already have the disease. And then it was important to show that LPA is associated with the progression of the disease once you have it. And actually, this is what we, we found in a, in a postdoc analysis of the astronomer trial. The astronomer trial, by the way, which is among the three trials that fail <laughs> to demonstrate a benefit of statin, but at least we learn on the natural history and found that LPA, indeed, uh, the, those patients with LPA was about one third of the, of the, of the group. Uh, actually had a twofold faster progression of the, of the stenosis. And, and LPA, you know, uh, about 20% of the general population uh, have high LPA. And it is determined genetically uh, to a large extent. So if you have high LPA, you can become, you know, a vegetarian and start, uh, starting to meditate and do a <laughs> one marathon a month, and it will not change not your LPA by, by even 1%. And up to now, there was you know, uh, not very good options to reduce LPA. Um, uh, there was niacin, but it was a modest impact and with many side effects. Uh, but now there are some, uh, you know, the, uh, the PCSK9 in right. inhibitors may both work on LDL yeah. and LPA without the procalcifying effect. So that might be an interesting uh, therapy. The also some, some uh, uh, some investigators have demonstrated uh, a very potent effect of uh, oligonucleotide antisense. So the only drawback is that you need to inject, right. but they have, you know, a uh, slow release form with, that you can inject once a month and reduce the LPA by 90%. Goodness. So, so that, if you want to do a trial, that would be, uh, because it's really very specific. It only changes LPA. So, and there are some trials that are actually going to start uh, this year. Uh, both with PCSK9 and, um, and LPA lowering using uh, oligonucleotide antisense. So we'll see. But I think, you know, it is an interesting hypothesis. It will not be for all patients. No, no. Uh, because I think there are, what we've, in all studies, uh, what we found is that the lipid story, LDL, uh, LPA inflammation, is more in the younger population. When you go into the elderly population, what the signals that we have we, we lose the signal of, you know, the association with the lipid uh, uh, markers, but we see more in association with the phosphocalcic metabolism and, uh, and osteoporosis. And so and that's, yeah, yeah. So I mean, well, there, there, had there, there had been some feelings that uh, osteoporotic drugs might be of some benefit looking and, at and that, but that hadn't panned out, has it, Jeff? No, there is an ongoing trial okay. looking okay. at this. Uh, so, uh, in England, actually. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that... that I don't think we'll find one drug fits right, all. Right. Uh, we'll need to uh, individualize the therapy. But it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. I mean, it's pretty interesting that that there may be a, a potential medical therapy that might slow progression. Exactly. Not going to cure it, but no. might slow progression. Absolutely. Well, it's fabulous. Listen, you've again uh, educated me as you do every time I listen to you and visit with you, and I, I know you've edu educated our audience. Thank you very much for joining me, and thank you all for joining us. Come back and watch again.